Good morning. Welcome to Hardin County Commissioner's Court. Today is Monday, November 23rd, and it is 10 a.m. Uh, all members of the court are present. The meeting will come to order. Item number two is the invocation. Reverend Daniel uh, White with First Baptist Church of Coons will deliver that for us this morning. Good morning, Reverend. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given us. And Father, I thank you for this great nation where we live in, where we have the freedoms to conduct business as we see fit, Lord, without fear of persecution. God, I pray that you'd be with the troops this morning overseas and here at home, that you would watch over them, protect them, and keep them safe as they defend those freedoms that we enjoy. Lord, we pray for all of our elected and appointed officials from the city to the county the state and the federal government, Lord, that you would be with them. Lord, help them to look to you for guidance and for wisdom as they lead this nation. Father, this morning we pray for this court, for each of the commissioners, for the judge. God, that you would be with them, give them wisdom, direction, and guidance as they conduct the business of this county. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend. Laura Kiefer, will you please lead the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Item number four, Glenda Austin, County Clerk, approval of minutes of prior meetings. Good that morning. would be a regular meeting on uh, November the 9th and a special meeting on uh, November the 16th. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Kirkendall and a second by Commissioner Cooper. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Austin. Number five, Deborah McWilliams, County Treasurer, presentation and approval of register claims to be canceled by court. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm asking that the court release me of the liability of $255,020.10. This is the total of the county's bills that were presented at the commissioner's court meeting held on November 9th, 2015. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Pelt and a second by Commissioner Roberts. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item number six, Deborah McWilliams, presentation and approval of cash statement. Um, this morning, our cash report summary and general checking account. We have $625,820.55 in our investment account at Wells Fargo. We have $2,382,505.83 in our text pool general account. We have $1,750,901.27 for total cash funds of $4,759,227.65. I move we accept the cash statement. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Kirkendall and a second by Commissioner Roberts. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, ma'am. Item number seven, Angela Gore, County Auditor, Payment of County Bills. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. The pre-approved expenditures and transfers for November the 10th, 2015 were $178,517.87. The pre-approved expenditures for November the 17th, 2015 were $6,451.34. And today, November the 23rd, 2015, the expenditures for Commissioner's Court are $215,340.05. The total expenditures and transfers are $400,309.26. Gross payroll for November the 12th, 2015 was $422,929.06. FICA was $30,875.22. Retirement was $59,851.08. And the total transfers for November, November the 12, 2015 payroll was $513,655.36. Move to pay the county bill. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Cooper and a second by Commissioner Pelt to pay the county bills. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. Item number eight, discussion and approval of resolution number 39-15, permitting firework sales on additional holidays pursuant to House Bill 1150. I move we approve resolution 39-15. I second it. 
I have a motion by Commissioner Kirkendall and a second by Commissioner Roberts. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner uh, Does the judge or any other of the uh, members of the court have knowledge of if the uh, <clears throat> court does not pass a resolution, would state law still go into effect for the county? No. This is our option. State right. gave us the right to do it, but it's our option to do it. Has anybody heard any opposition from the public or anything on it? So I have not. I have I have not. not. That's all I got, Judge. Do we need to go over the dates, the, the new dates, uh, the three additional dates other than we the ones that we already have? Uh, we could. That would be February the 25th through March the 1st for Texas Independence Day fireworks season. Also from April the 16th through April the 20th for San Jacinto Day fireworks season. Then we have the Wednesday before the last Monday in May through the last Sunday in May for Memorial Day fireworks season. <clears throat> All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Kirkendall and a second by Commissioner Roberts. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Number nine, Debbie, McW Debbie Mendesable. Deb you didn't want to speak again? <laughs> Debbie Mendesable, mm -hmm. Human Resources Director, presentation of proposed <coughs> changes to the Hardin County personnel policy and the travel policy. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the personnel policy consisted of Commissioner Pelt, Commissioner Roberts, <coughs> Monica Kelly from Juvenile, uh, Michelle Brister from the County Attorney's Office, and myself from Human Resources. There's a packet in your folder that shows the changes that are proposed. First of all, we'll start with the travel policy. Travel policy was reviewed, and the change that was um, proposed is uh, to put a sentence in there <coughs> saying, if receiving a vehicle allowance, there will be no mileage reimbursement for travel. And that was the only change, and the committee decided to keep that a separate policy from the personnel policy. The next change is on Section 3 of the personnel policy. On evaluations, it did state that all employees shall be evaluated once a year at a minimum. That has been changed to may be evaluated. And then it also, the evaluation shall be written on forms prescribed by the Human Resource Department. It has been changed to the evaluation may be written on forms prescribed by the human, I mean, prescribed by the human resources department. Uh, also on number three on that same page, um, when it talks about discipline, a copy should be provided to human resources department. And then another uh, item was added, number four, if an employee is being disciplined or being considered for termination, an evaluation should be completed and a copy provided to human resources. Debbie, can I ask a question right quick? Yes, sir. In regards to the evaluations, uh, and, and I agree with the uh, changing of the wording to May, I conduct evaluations once a year on my employees, but I never forward them to you. I keep them in personnel uh, files in my office. Should that be forwarded to you? Yes, they should be forwarded for their personnel file. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next item was on section nine on on-call duties. It used to read that on-call staff may require an employee to carry a beeper or leave a number where he or she can be reached. Well, since we <coughs> usually don't carry beepers anymore, most people don't, it uh, should be changed to on-call staff may require an employee to leave a number where he or she can be reached. The next change proposed is on retirement. Section 17 is added that Hardin County will be responsible for 75% of the monthly health rate for those employees who retire with 30 or more years of active service. I got a question. This is going to impact our budget. Yes, it will. Shouldn't this be taken up at a budget workshop? Uh, Possibly. Since you were the chair of that committee, would you like to address that? I, I, I have probably, no objections to that. Yeah, I, I probably agree with that. Yeah. Okay. I can. <clears throat> When we come to the motion, then I will move to table that and handle it in budget session. Okay. Okay. That's a good point. And that was that's the end of the proposed changes for the personnel policy. Going back to that, uh, Chris, that was a good point. However, uh, I agree with this change, and I would vote for that. Uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. When, when the committee met, did y'all put uh, a pin to how much it would affect us or, or not? We did, and Debbie, I believe it was something like twenty thousand dollars, wasn't it? So somewhere's in that. And it all depends if we're going to go retroactive or not. 
and how long that retroactive period would be. I think even if you did, because of the way the uh, our employees, the ages and everything else, you're not going to have too many that fall no, under there, those guidelines. Right. right now we have two employees that had over 30 uh, years that have already retired. We have one that will retire at the end of this month. Um, we also, one moment, <clears throat> we have an employee that's presently employed that has 32 years, another that has 30 years, and one that has 29. Those three are still employed. Out of, the, out of those, do you have knowledge of which ones uh, would be eligible for Medicare or Medicaid once they retire because we only cover up to our age of yes, 65? Yes, to 65. Right, right. One moment. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> I believe two of them will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, I, can I add something to this too? Uh, just <clears throat> something to grasp and think. <clears throat> Not only will this promote a, a little bit of longevity within Hardin County because we, we're, you know, we're all seeing people leaving and leaving and leaving. But at, you know, if you were to retire with 27 years, you would get 50 percent. If you stayed to those start to that 30 year period to get the 75 percent it would actually decrease the amount of money that the county would have to spend for that 50 percent for those three three years yeah so you would actually you know it would actually be a savings on the county if those people worked on to 30 years to get that 75 percent get so closer yeah. to the 65 yeah. right yeah. It's, it's it's pretty much an incentive for longevity but it's also an incentive to help us as far as our finances well, I think it's a great idea. With, yeah. I just think we need to know how much. We either have right. to do a budget amendment now, and we have to know how much that's going to be, or we have to put this off to the next budget. Yeah. One of the, one I of the support other. the policy. Right. Yeah. But the, today's presentation is a presentation. There will be no action until the next court meeting, mm -hmm. and then at that time, when we make the motion or the recommendation, and the motion be based upon it, it will be amended to take the this 75 percent and put it into the budget hearings and uh, so that will actually delay it then till June but I would like to commend the committee for the work they've done especially for Debbie and Monica they've carried the load on this thing thank Alvin you. and I kind of rode along thank you <laughs> thank y'all thank y'all very much thank you the question that I have uh, Okay, on the travel, is that going to be uh, for everybody that's receiving a car allowance and then whether or not it's a trip to Jefferson County, whether or not it's a trip to San Marcos, does it matter? Makes no okay. difference. If you receive a travel allowance, regular travel allowance, then you will have to cover your travel in your travel allowance. Okay. Vehicle allowance. Yeah. And then on uh, <coughs> this number four, if an employee has been disciplined or being considered for termination, an evaluation should be completed and copy provided to human resources. Okay, are you going to provide that evaluation? Yes, I can. Or can we? Ha and what I'd like to see is a standardized evaluation that would cover all the legal aspects. I'm supposing we need to address, yes, and uh, and then if we could just use that throughout countywide. Right. So, I'd like I'd like to, I'd like <coughs> us to have a uniform evaluation. Do you have that form already? Yes, I do. Okay. Let's, uh, let's just go ahead and send it out to all of the elected officials and department heads okay. so that everybody has it. Will do. Okay. Appreciate y'all's hard work. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? All right. Thanks again, Debbie and Monica. Thank you. And, of course, Commissioner Felt and Commissioner Roberts. <laughs> Item number 10 is also Debbie Mendesable. Acknowledgement of receipt of $1,300 from the <coughs> Association of Counties Employer Rewards Program. Yes, sir. Hardin County received a check for $1,300 uh, for the rewards program through TAC. Last year it was for $900, so it's a considerable increase. The way it works is Hardin County employees earn Visa gift cards for the health assessment, which is usually from January 1st to March 31st and then a $25 gift card for the uh, Sonic Boom Spring Challenge. Uh, employer, the employer earns $25 for each activity that employees participate in. So we had 31 pe 33 people, I'm sorry, that uh, participated in the health assessment and 19 people that did the Sonic Boom 8-Week Challenge. 
So that amounted to 52 people at $25 a piece, which was $1,300. Uh, TAC encourages us to put that money back into the workplace as far as uh, the health fairs and things of that nature to help fund those things. Looks to me like that check went to Commissioner Kirkendall. I mean, Christian, you work with this program with yeah, Gabby work, work with Rose and with yeah, it, and, and we yeah. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very much. Okay, so thank you. I think you had to have a sponsor off the court. Is that right? Someone yes, from sir. the court? Yeah. Yes, sir. So. You going to do that again in January? Yeah, All right. absolutely. Item number 11, Esther Scarborough, floodplain administrator. Discussion and possible action regarding acceptance of final plat of Windsor Heights subdivision phase two. Good morning, Ms. Scarborough. <coughs> should have had in your packet a letter from Mark Whiteley and Associates. Yes, ma'am. And it lists out four items that needed to be uh, resolved before uh, um, this, he wanted this to be approved. Now, the first one, the word proposed, as used in the described a utility easement, should be removed as this is the final plat. And if you look up there, it has been changed to new. The second one, the word Whispering Pines and the address of the developer is misspelled and should be corrected. And the, a diff, their mailing address is put on there, so that's been corrected. Now, the third one, the z, uh, point zero zero four four five acre track remainder is not labeled as to the owner a deed reference and should be corrected. And if you see, I've drawn an arrow up to one, up on the left side and also into the description where they describe that. That's all, it describes all those pieces of property. And I checked with Scott Skinner who drew this and he said that's <laughs> normally how it's done. Okay. And the Homeowners Association has agreed to that. Is that what you explained uh, to me? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> and number four, the culvert schedule should show actual sizes utilized and not state or equal. But I believe that um, the developer and Mr. Cooper have agreed that this should be, uh, give them the latitude to change that if they need to uh, by how maybe the water flows through there, that it doesn't lock you into a certain size. I have not had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Whiteley in reference to his recommendation on this to find out what his, uh, his reasoning behind it is. <coughs> However, I have uh, met with the developer and in the past uh, we have, uh, certain diameter uh, culverts that have been put in place and due to uh, unforeseen problems with drainage, we have uh, increased those. So I don't have a problem with equal staying in there at this time. And that's just wording. Right, and that would keep us from, uh, if we did have to change them, <coughs> to keep from having to come back to court and do a uh, adjustment on the plan. Right. So it still says or equal? It's going to still plan. say or equal, and if uh, if I meet with Mr. Whiteley and there's some reasoning that I think that it shouldn't, uh, I'm I'm satisfied now. I spoke with the developer. I'm satisfied now with the way it is. We'll come back and make a modification to it, uh, but I would put in a motion that we accept this plan. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Cooper and a second by Commissioner Pell. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Esther. Item number 12, Misty Whitney, purchasing agent. Discussion and possible action regarding results of proposals received <coughs> for motor fuel, oil, and lubricants for all road and bridge precincts. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Ms. Whitney. Bids were open on November the 6th, 2015 at two o'clock in the purchasing department. Myself and Erica Cooper were present for fuel. Uh, the first one was Suncoast Resources. Um, do you all want me to just read the markup or read the, that's usually what we get early on that. I'll just read it all. Rack price was 1.43. Waiting on you to answer. What, uh, wait on me. what, what about total? Well, I think the others <coughs> fluctuate, so we usually went by the markup, but. Um, okay. Because the total delivery price can change. Yes. Sir. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so, Suncoast markup was 0.2895 for both regular 87 fuel and number 
Liberty Diesel. CNI Oil Company Inc. Their markup was 0.125 cents per gallon for both regular gasoline and for Liberty Diesel. Midtex Oil. Their markup was 0.12 cents per gallon for both regular and diesel. So they were the apparent low. Has anybody uh, had any dealings with Midtex? Have they ever bid before? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes, they have? Yes, it's been a while, but they bid. And I believe we have chosen them. Because they were the low bidder, right? And they're in Beaumont, so, you know. Do we still do the vetting to make sure we can get priority during a storm? I did speak to him about emergency and possession, and they assured me they had taken care of it. <clears throat> You want to go ahead and continue with the transmission fluid? Okay, automatic transmission fluid, uh, CNI Oil Company, uh, was $445 for a 55 gallon drum. Texas Refinery Corp, $2,026.75 for a 55 gallon drum. Suncoast Resources was uh, $589.05 for a 55 gallon drum. Schaefer Manufacturing, $1,672 for a 55-gallon drum, and Midtex Oil was $493.76 for a 55-gallon drum. The apparent low was CNI Oil Company. And for motor fuel, CNI Oil Company was $555.05 for a 55-gallon drum. Texas Refinery Corp. $1,102.75 for 55-gallon drum. Suncoast Resources, $583 for a 55-gallon drum. Schaefer Manufacturing was $1,008.32 for the drum. And Midtex Oil, $480.48 for drum. So the apparent low is Midtex. <coughs> this is for motor oil, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Move we accept the motor fuel bid results as presented. Second. Have a motion by Commissioner Pelt and a second by Commissioner Kirkendall. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item number 13, Misty Whitney, discussion and possible action regarding results of sale of surplus office furniture and other miscellaneous items. This one's really long. Is it okay if I read? Yes, ma'am. Sealed bids for sale of surplus office equipment, furniture, and other miscellaneous items were opened in the West Wing courtroom on November 20th, 2015 at 2 p.m. Trudy Unruh, Misty Whitney, and Erica Cooper were present, as were a lot of people just waiting to see who was the highest bidder. Lot A was a credenza cassette tape storage and motor boxes. Colette Nelson for $1.50. Lot B, two four-drawer file cabinets. Colette Nelson, $1.50. Lot C is one two-drawer file cabinet and a printer stand. Debbie Walters for $20. Lot D, one five-drawer file cabinet, two metal storage boxes. Tom Hughes for $5. Lot E was three four-drawer file cabinets. Keith Sims for $5. Lot F was a school desk, a bulletin board, and two wooden chairs. Dana Hogg for $40. Lot G is a large wood desk. Billy Carraway, $145. He must have really wanted that. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, please. <laughs> <laughs> Lot H, rolling storage shelf, a hospital table, and a voter box. Monica Kelly for $36. Lot I was a large wood desk. Whitney Del Grego for $10. Lot J, a blue chair and an end table. Teresa Smith for $50. <coughs> Lot K, a round table and two chairs. Janice Warren for $12.21. Lot L, two two-drawer file cabinets. Hallie Bradford, $21.99. Lot M, large green file cabinet and four metal storage boxes. Robert Davis for $100. Lot N, two file cabinets. C.L. Kirkus for $21.05. Lot O was a large high table and a gray chair. 
Linda Kellum for $50. Lot P, large table leather maroon chair and a leather maroon chair. Whitney Del Grego for $20. Lot Q, one two drawer and one four drawer filing cabinet. P, $5. Lot R, large table, two metal storage boxes and a metal paper organizer. This one was a tile, so we're just gonna draw names. Heath Sims and Debbie Walters both did $20. I'll flip a coin or what do you do? We're drawing a name. We're drawing a name. Okay. Hey, Sam's. Okay, the next one is lot S, small table, blue chairs, printer, rolling cart, and a plate. Donna Summers for $30. <laughs> lot T was a small table, metal storage box, Monica Kelly for $11. Lot U was a school desk and a drum stool, David Lisenby for $12.50. Lot V was a coat rack, small storage table, heater, metal paper organizer, Debbie McGregor for $50. Lot W was a printer stand, small table, metal rolling cart, and a plastic mat, Amanda Harper, $30. Lot X, two-tone computer desk, pink chair, metal paper organizer, and a heated footrest, Kyle Peters for $150. Lot Y was a table and a plastic mat, Colette Nelson for $1.50. <coughs> Lot Z, 27 rolling chairs, Dale Wilford, $189. Lot AA, printer stand, black rolling cart, plastic mat, and voter boxes, Jim Brennan for $40. Lot B, bookshelf, paper towel holder, burgundy chair, small storage cabinet, was Shirley Cook for $20. Lot CC, Kyle Peters, I'm sorry, large wooden shelf and a paper towel holder, Kyle Peters for $175. Lot DD was a bookshelf and a paper towel holder, <coughs> Kathy Brown, $30. Lot EE, large table and a paper towel holder. Again, we had a tie, it was Heath Sims and Betty Henson for $5. Can you spell again? He's pretty lucky today. <laughs> <laughs> Lot FF, voter boxes, Colette Nelson, $11.50. Lot GG, Stainless steel refrigerator with double doors. Robert Davis for $85. Lot HH, small desk and two brown chairs. Donna Summers for $30. And finally, lot II was voter boxes. Dale Williford for $41. Our total was $1,475.75. Great job. Thank you very much. I got a question. Let's see, on, on lot HH, you had two $30 bids. Yes, ma'am. That's the first one is that H H H. Good catch, Ivan. The winners, he sounds. He's a late Charles. <laughs> I don't even know. <clears throat> he should be. That's what I'm thinking. Good thing we drew. All right. So Linda Kellum is the winner of lot HH. All right. Anybody want to make a motion? You want to make a motion to? Do we have to oh. accept those bids, yeah. Misty? Yeah, we have. Motion accept. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Cooper and a second by Commissioner Kirkendall to accept the bids as presented by Misty Whitney. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Then Commissioner Kirkendall made a motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Commissioner Cooper, we stand adjourned. Right.